Okay, so day 01, that's what this one is. Number one, which of the following defines a function f for which this is true? f of negative x equals negative f of x. That defines what type of function, first of all? Not even. Oh, yeah, good. Bless you. At least you recognize it's an algebraic test for symmetry. And this is the result of an odd function, which has what type of symmetry? Origin. Right. Because when you replace x at negative x, if you get the opposite of a positive x, you have origin sy symmetry, like our old friend x cubed, right? Plug in an x, you're going to get out a certain y value. Plug in the opposite x, and you're going to get out the opposite y value. Now, for what it's worth, the other test would be if you replace x with negative x and get the same thing, positive x's and negative x's give you the exact same thing, then you have an even function with y-axis symmetry. So this is not really a calculus question. So I doubt if you would see this one on the AP exam, but it's still fair game, all right? So they're going to give you some of these parent functions, and you just have to know what the symmetry is. Is x squared even, odd, or neither? It's an even function, right? That's right. y-axis symmetry, so it's, it's even, not odd. Log base 10 of x. Well, that looks a lot like the natural log of x, like that. Does that have any symmetry at all? No, so that one has no symmetry. Sine of x, that's Sahala. It looks like this. Even, odd, or neither? Odd. odd. There you go. There is the correct answer, B. Origin symmetric. You're not anything, whatever. You're not going to turn it in. So whatever you're more comfortable with. All right, now E to the X for what it's worth looks like that. Does it have any symmetry? No symmetry. And then cosine was chala. That had, that was an even function. Yeah, Y axis symmetry. So the correct answer was B. All right. Number two is another question that I doubt you'll see because it's not specifically calculus, but it is related to calculus. It's pre-calculus. The natural log of x minus 2 is less than 0 for what values of x? Okay, so if you look at the parent function, natural log of x, it has a vertical asymptote on the y-axis and an x-intercept at 1, 0. What then does, do, does the minus 2 effect have on this graph? Shifts it right to, right? It would for any graph. So now the vertical asymptote is at 2, and the x-intercept is at 3. So here's what the graph looks like. And we want to know now for what values of x is that graph negative. Well, that's below the x-axis, and it's on the very small interval between the vertical asymptote and the x-intercept, which is from 2 to 3, which is answer choice C. So the reason we take pre-calculus before calculus is so that we can learn and master this type of stuff. And every once in a while, they may throw a pre-cal question on there, and it should be rewarding you, not penalizing you. Now, number three is a good question. Could appear on this uh, year's exam, but not in this format. This is kind of archaic format. Uh, it wouldn't be listed like this, in other words. So this brace, which is right there, it would not be in that location. Uh, so let me kind of modify this, and I'll show you what it would look like. If this showed up on today's test, it would be a piecewise function as we're used to seeing them, which would be more like this. The brace would be here, and they'd have a k right there, and then it would say for x equals 2. All right? So here's what this one means then. It says, let f of x equal this function on the top to the left and right of 2, and then when x is 2, we're going to define it to be some number k, whatever k is. And what we're trying to do then is make f continuous at 2 by finding a value of k. So continuity at a point. We're trying to make it continuous at 2. What's the three-step definition for continuity? Yeah, road, bridge, road. The limit from the right exists, the limit from the left exists, and they equal the function value. Limit from the left equals the function value equals the limit from the right. Good. So notice that to the left of 2 and to the right of 2, it's the same function. So what do you get when you plug a 2 into this? You get 3 minus 3, which is 0 over 0. So this piece right here has a hole at x equals 2. And that's why it says when x is 2, what's the value of k that essentially plugs the hole? We want it to be continuous. So to find the value of k that plugs the hole, really what we're interested in finding here is the limit 
as x goes to 2 of that function. 2x plus 5, bless you, minus the square root of x plus 7, bless you, all over x minus 2, bless you. That's what we're looking for. If we can find the limit of that piece, we'll have the y value of the whole, and then we can let k equal that value. Well, direct substitution is going to give you 0 over 0. We've already kind of tried that, which means you could use RATCON or... Or L'Hopital's rule. We studied that yesterday. If you get 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity when you're evaluating a limit, you can evaluate the limit of the quotient of the derivatives. Okay? So the derivative of the top over the derivative of the bottom. Well, the derivative of the top is going to require two terms with the chain rule. So very carefully here, that's going to be a 1 half, 2x plus 5, the negative one half times the chain rule two. That's the first term's derivative, minus the second term's derivative, one half x plus seven to the negative one half times one x plus seven's derivative. That's the derivative of the top, and now the derivative of the bottom is what? One. Boy, that's easy. So as we did yesterday, before we plug back in, we're going to want to simplify. Well, only thing divided by one is itself, so we're just going to have the two terms in the numerator. And if you notice, the 1 half and the 2 divide out. So we're just left with 1 over the square root of 2x plus 5. And then minus 1 over 2, square root of x plus 7. And now we just try direct substitution again. If you plug in a 2 now, you're going to get 1 over 3. Minus 1 over 3 times 2 is 1 sixth. What's a third minus a sixth? 1 sixth. And since that's the limit of the top piece, that's where that function has a whole. If we then let x equal, or k, sorry, equal 1, 6, we will plug the hole. And now the graph is continuous. So RATCON still works there, as we mentioned yesterday, but it's kind of fun to have this new tool called L'Hopital's Rule. Derivative over the derivative. Only works there when you get 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. But this is one of those times. So a good little question. It combined L'Hopital's Rule with continuity. That's a good question. Hey, speaking of good questions, here's a good one. It's a definite integral. You might rewrite it reflexively like that. Remember doing that? You have a quantity in the bottom. I said your first step could be to just bring everything to the top. We can't expand that, can we? So we would just do pattern recognition. I have an inside function of 1 plus x. What's its derivative? 1. Do we have a 1 out front? Kind of, yeah. We're not off by anything. So we've got it. This is going to be a power rule. So blob to the negative one-half becomes blob to the one-half, and then instead of dividing by one-half, we'll multiply by two, and the blob goes along for the ride. So that's a real simple pattern recognition, way back from 4.4. Now it's a definite integral, so now we evaluate it from zero to ocho. Now it's my preference, as it may be is yours, to leave coefficients when you're evaluating by the fundamental theorem out front. It's less to carry through on each term, and it's also fun to draw beefy brown bracket. So two beefy bracket, plug in the top, and you get 8 plus 1 is 9 to the 1 half, minus when you plug in a 0, you get 1 to the 1 half. Now, free response, we're done, right? There's an exact answer. We're walking away. But that doesn't look like it's an answer choice. So we'll go a little further. 9 to the 1 half is what? 3. It's the square root of 9. So 3 minus 1 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. And there's your answer. Simple, little, antiderivative. Definite integral. <clears throat> All right. Uh, number 5. 3x squared, 2xy, y squared, 2. Find the derivative at 1. Okay. Well... First thing you're going to notice is this thing is not solved for y. So before you think about maybe just doing implicit differentiation straight up, see if you can solve it for y. Because if you can, it's going to be easier, especially since they only gave you an x value. Can you solve that thing for y? Not very easily because it's got a squared term and a non-squared term. So no big deal. We'll just take the derivative implicitly. So d dx, here we go. Anything that's not x, namely y, gets a dy dx, chain rule. So we get 6x plus, now here's where you have to start being real careful. You have a product rule, two factors, two terms, one at a time. 
So 2x becomes 2 times y goes for the ride, plus 2x goes for the ride times the derivative of y is dy dx. Good. And then you mosey over to the y squared, and it becomes 2y times the chain rule, dy dx. Yeah. Remember, you take inventory. If you have two y terms, you should have two dy dx's. And then, of course, the derivative of 2 is 0. <clears throat> now, typically, if you're after a numeric answer, like we are here, you're going to want to plug in prior to solving for dy dx because things will start combining a lot faster as numbers rather than as different variables, possibly. The only problem is they only gave me x equals 1, and I need to find the y value in order to plug it in. I guess I have one way to do that. How can I find the y value when x is 1? Plug it in there. That's the, uh, that's the equation that relates x to y. So if I plug in a 1, and remember, this is multiple choice, so you're not going to get dinged for lack of notation, but you want to show enough that you understand what you're doing. So that's a 3 plus a 2y plus a y squared equals 2. And if you get everything on one side, namely the left, and you write it in descending order, you get y squared plus 2y plus 1 equals 0. And now I know what you're thinking at this point. Crap. It's y squared. There could be two different y values. Which one am I supposed to use? Well, let's see if the problem fixes itself. If you factor this, you get y plus 1 times y plus 1, or y plus 1 squared. So it turns out there is only one y value. Thank goodness, because otherwise I wouldn't know how to tell you to choose. So now you have both the x and the y. And now you're ready to plug in. But you've got to be careful, because they're different numbers. So x is going to be a 1, y is going to be a negative 1. So plugging back into the derivative, we get a 6 minus 2y plus 2 dy dx minus 2 dy dx equals 0. And now what you would do is you would solve for dy dx. But what happens with your two terms with dy dx in them? They cancel. Oops, I still have my y there. That meant to be a negative 2. If they cancel, you don't have any variables anymore. You just have 4 equals 0. No, it don't. It does not equal 0. So whenever you end up with your variables going away, and an untrue statement that's left, guess what the answer is going to be? Undefined, right? It's not true. Okay, It's never defined there. So kind of an anticlimactic result, all that worked for just D and E. But it did review the whole process of implicit differentiation. Yeah, it's been a while. Normally, your dy dx's will not just cancel out. You'll have to solve for dy dx, and you'll have dy dx equals a number. And that number will be one of your answer choices. All right, remember, this was back from 1969. An oldie but a goodie. Speaking of oldie but a goodie, I like this one. The limit as h goes to 0. As soon as you read limit as h goes to 0, it should raise a red flag, right? Big D, not Dallas. See Tony Romo last night? Got to be a Maverick for that. It was pretty cute. What? No? Derivative. Derivative. This is the definition of the derivative of a function, right? The limit as h goes to 0. h is exclusively used for delta x, okay, for derivative definition. So this is the one where you're like, I don't like you number plus h. Remember that? I don't like you number plus h. So if you cross it out, you're staring at 8x to the 8. And so what this limit is, is it's the derivative of that function, but not evaluated at x, it's evaluated at 1 half. So rather than evaluate the limit by a sledgehammer <clears throat> to the 8th power, no thank you, we'll find the derivative another way. We'll take the derivative using the power rule, and then we'll plug in a 1 half. So here we go. F prime is 64x to the 7th. And then you plug in a 1 half. And you get 64 times 1 7 or 1 half to the 7th power. Now, College Board is making you a little bit of work here. That's the same as 64 over 2 to the 7th. Well, 2 to the 7th is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is 32, times 2 is 64, 
times another 2 would be to the 7th power, which is 128. So basically, 2 to the 6 is 64, and there's 1, 2 left over. So however you get there, it ends up being 1 half. You're just doing powers of 2. So you might have to go up to the side and do a little arithmetic, a little, little adding, a little multiplying, a little dividing, a little subtracting. That's all fine. Okay? Don't think you have to do everything in your head. But the numbers should be manageable. Now, that's not the only way to do it. But what if this question didn't have numbers? It could have been more of a theory question. It could have said, this limit represents what? And the answer would have been the derivative of 8x to the 8th evaluated at 1 half. But because it was numeric, you could have said, never not first. Never, never not first. Plug in. What do you get when you plug in a 0 for h? You get 8 half to the 8th minus 8 half to the 8th. That is... 0 over 0. <laughs> L'Hopital's rule, does it work? It does. As long as you realize you're taking the derivative with respect to h, now not x. So this would be 8 blob to the 8. So by the chain rule, the derivative of the first term is 64, 1 half plus h to the 7th power times the chain rule. What's the derivative of 1 half plus h with respect to h? 1, right? It's 0 plus 1. Minus, what's the derivative of this constant? 0. All over, what's the derivative of h with respect to h? 1. So this over 1 is just that. So there it is. Now L'Hopital's rule says, try direct substitution again, and you get 64 times 1 half to the 7, which is the exact same thing we just did. Wow. Go, go, Gadget. L'Hopital's rule. Thanks, Bernoulli. That's what you really want to say. If you remember nothing else from this class when you're like 80 years old, I want you to remember that L'Hopital's rule is really Bernoulli's rule. So we hear some like teenagers talking about L'Hopital's rule. It was Bernoulli! Johan! I remember that in calculus. Okay? Um, notice the answer choice E is kind of interesting. It says it cannot be determined from the information given. That is a very different type of answer than I cannot determine it from the information given. That's a different answer, okay? Number seven. Right, and they wouldn't do that. But I, some people misread that. Well, it's true because I could not determine it from the information given. That's a true statement. Yeah, but it can. You can't. It can't. Which is sad because it's inanimate. And you are animate. And then, then there's a whole long argument after that. Abandonment right there. Yeah, I don't know if it was worth it. Okay, number seven, number seven. For what value of K, they like Ks, what can I say? X plus K over X will have a relative max at X equals negative two. Local max, same thing. All right, so whether it's a local max or local min, those things can only occur at what X values? X values. No, critical values, critical values, good. So we must first decide if there is a critical value at negative 2 or force there to be one. So if you want to call this function f, because it's just an expression, in order to take the derivative, you would probably write it as k times x to the negative first, right? And now the derivative of f, f prime, is going to be 1 minus kx to the negative second, which, if you simplify that, is 1 minus k over x squared. So here is the derivative. Now what you want to do is see if at negative 2 you can force the derivative to be 0 or undefined. So when you plug in a negative 2, you get 1 minus k over 4. Well, that thing is never undefined because k is in the numerator. So to be a critical value, it better be what? Bless you. It better be 0. And now you can solve that linear equation, and you get k is equal to 4. So what that means is, at x equals negative 2, when k is positive 4, we at least have a critical value. Notice what one of the answer choices is. 4. Now notice this is the only critical value at negative 2. So I would say normally go with 4, except answer choice E. Stupid answer choice E. Guess what that's forcing you to consider now? Is every critical value going to be a local maximum? 
No, it could be either a local minimum or neither, right? If this answer choice E was like five instead of none of these, then you could just go with four and walk away, right? Because it's the only answer that makes sense. But because it said none of these, we have to check. So here's one way to do it. If you plug K back in there, you get F prime equals one minus four over X squared. And now you could do the first derivative test, right? Here's X, here's F prime. And remember, we're testing it at negative two. So if you pick like a negative three and a negative one, you want to stay to the left of zero because there's a VA there. We're looking for a sign change now. If it's really a local maximum, this should change from what to what? Positive, Positive to negative. Let's see. Plug in a negative three, you get one minus four ninths. One minus four ninths is positive. Plug in a negative one, you get one minus four, which is negative. Since F prime changes from positive to negative at X equals negative two, F has a local maximum at X equals negative two. So the answer was four. But if you would have gone with it without considering it, you could have been wrong. Because if that had been a local min, then the answer would have been none of these. Or if it was positive or negative on either side, it would have been none of these. So, well played, college board. You made me check. Turns out I didn't have to. Could have just gone with it. And now I squandered like 30 more seconds. But now we know. Yeah, 69. This is still off 69. Yeah. All right, this one here, I I I um I seriously doubt you'll have this question on on the test. This is more like an algebra two question. It's the remainder theorem. If you have p of x equals x plus two x plus k, which is a quadratic factored, and the remainder is twelve when you divide it by the linear factor x minus one, then what's the value of k? If you just want to watch here and be like, oh, I kind of remember that from pre-cal slash algebra two, that's fine. If you distribute this, you get x squared plus 2x plus kx plus 2k. And then if you combine your k, uh, x's, you get the coefficient of x to be 2 plus k. And then your constant is 2k. So what you could do is synthetic division. When you divide this quadratic by the linear factor x minus 1, it's like synthetically substituting a positive 1. So remember to do synthetic division, you would write out your coefficient. So 1, 2 plus k, and 2k, and we would synthetically divide with 1. So you bring down the 1, and you get 1. And you multiply, and you put it there, you add, you get 3 plus k. When you multiply by 1, you get 3 plus k, you add, you get 3 plus 3k. This last box, if you recall, is your remainder box. And if that were 0, then x minus 1 would be a factor. Well, it said that the remainder was 12. So once you set that equal to 12, you could then solve that linear equation, and you get 3k equals 9, so k equals 3. That would be a great question on a pre-cal test next year in my class, after we study polynomials and the remainder theorem. Probably not going to be on the AP exam, though, but still a fantastic question. Okay. Number nine, I like it. Okay, good calculus question. When the area in square units of an expanding circle is increasing twice as fast as the radius is increasing, what is the radius? Okay, when we talked about an area changing and a radius changing, what concept was that? Not optimization. That's to be if we're trying to maximize the area. Related rates. Yeah, good. So what this is going to require is writing a related rate math equation from the verbal description. So let's do it. When the area of a circle is increasing, how do we talk about the rate of change of area? D A D T, right? So when that quantity, D A D T, is, it says, getting bigger twice as fast as the radius, that would be 2 times D R D T. All right, so what we've now said is the area is getting bigger at a rate that is twice the rate at which the radius is getting bigger. What is the radius? So at that moment, we want to figure out what R is. So I need to find another way to relate A to R in a circle. Anyone? Area of a circle? Pi R squared. Right, pi R squared. 
So now I can take the derivative of both sides with respect to T, and I get dA dt equals 2 pi r times the chain rule dr dt. And since this is the relation they gave me at that moment, I can now use that as substitution. So I'm going to replace dA dt over here with a 2 dr dt. This becomes 2 dr dt equals 2 pi r dr dt. And what happens with your 2s? Sayonara. What happens with your dr dt's? Au revoir. Hello. Write this second. Okay. Uh-huh. Chloe, you need to go see Miss Cobb, like, right now. Coach Cobb, I guess. Yeah. I don't know how long it's going to be, but it's, it's urgent enough to uh, interrupt calculus. So I'm recording it, so if you want to tune in, I'll put it in the shared folder. I'll create a folder for AP review. Okay. So anyway, uh, if you divide out, you're left with 1 on the left, and then you solve for R by dividing through by pi, and you get the radius at the moment is 1 over pi. So kind of an interesting related rate question. They didn't tell you what the radius was at a the moment. They didn't tell you what the area was at the moment. But it turns out that your other variable of dr dt divided out. Okay, so it wasn't really needed. All right, number 10, the last one. Again, this one, not so much a calculus question, but still a fantastic question. The set of all points e to the t's power comma t, where t is a real number, is the graph of what? y equals. Okay, y equals. Now, this was a little bit backwards from what we're used to seeing. Normally, we would see it like this, t comma e of t. And this would be your x, and that would be your y. So that would be the graph of y equals e to the t power. But they're backwards, right? So what that means is x is equal to e to the t power, and y is equal to t. Yeah. All I have to do is substitute in. If you don't see it right away, I'm just going to plug that in right there. So I get x equals e to the y power. And all I have to do is, because it said y is equal to what, is just solve for y. And we do that by natural logging both sides. So there it is. y equals the natural log of x. So a super easy question if you know what to do. It doesn't take long at all. You can almost just look at it and say, hey, that's kind of backwards. All right? When we find inverses, what do we do with ordered pairs? We, we interchange them, right? So xy becomes yx. So if you recognize that, you can do it that way too. E to the tt, if I interchange it, becomes t e to the t. That would be the inverse of e, which is the natural log. So anyway, kind of an interesting question. Don't get hung up on a lot of these if they're not calculus questions, because I doubt you'll see them. Um, but the calculus ones are really, really good. All right, so now we're going to jump to the free response. And tomorrow, when we go over the multiple choice, we won't have to go through all of them, because you'll have questions maybe on just a few so we'll have more time to go through the free response. It's going to feel a little rushed here, but that's okay. Uh, this first question was the fourth question on the 2000 exam, and this one goes way back, 200 AD. This was on the non-abacus portion of the calculus exam. I actually missed a zero here. Bless you. Bless you. Um, it was also on the same exam. It was the very next question. These were consecutive questions in 2000. So here we go. Uh, both no calculator, by the way. Water is pumped, as water should be, because it's, it's very important. Water should always be pumped. It is pumped into an underground tank. So if you want to draw an underground tank above ground so you can see it, it's not bad. It's being pumped in at a constant rate, it says, of 8 gallons per minute. That's a constant rate. That's pretty important. Don't need calculus for constant rates of change. Water is leaking... Uh-oh, someone better fix it. At a rate of the square root of t plus 1, gallons per minute. So that's a variable rate. So immediately, if you see a variable, gallons per minute, just tell yourself, if I integrate that function, what are my units going to be? Gallons, right? If you integrate gallons per minute, you're going to get gallons. You always lose one of the pers when you integrate. And that will tell me how much water was leaked out. It's good for a two-hour period from 0 to 120 minutes. And check this out. At t equals zero, we've got 30 gallons of water. That's an initial condition alert. 
So here's my little underground tank above ground. So immediately you might be thinking, oh, they're going to they're gonna be asking me how much water there is at any given time. It's a function now of three things, right? The water we started with, 30, plus the water we gained, 8 times whatever the time is, minus the water we lost, which would be the integral of that. So almost similar to the B problem, except water instead of Bs. Part A, how many gallons leaked out from 0 to 3? Okay, so get in the habit of labeling your integrals. So I'm just going to call it water, or you could say leaked, whatever. It's just going to be the integral from 0 to 3 of the square root of t plus 1 dt, right? There's your setup. Now, it's non-calculator, so we have to do it by hand. If you're going to integrate it by hand, you would probably write the square root as that to the one-half power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the rate at which it leaks out? Do you anti-derive to find, like, when it would leak out and what quantity of time leaking it? Like you could find the antiderivative and then put plus C. And then you would have to use this initial condition to find the value of C. Well, no, I don't think you'd even be able to do that. Yeah, and then plug in a 3. Okay. Yeah. Um, don't do it that way, though. Okay. Set it up as a depth or an integral. A lot, a lot better, okay? We started at 0. We don't really need the initial condition here because I don't want to know what was the amount at a given time. I just want to know what was the net change, how much leaked. So it's just the integral of the leak function. And now if you're going to integrate it, the derivative of the inside function is 1. So there's no correction. There's no rider. It just becomes blob to the 3 halves power with the 2 thirds. And that's just t plus 1. And then we evaluate it from 0 to 3. So now, again, I'll leave the two-thirds out front, beefy bracket, beefy blue bracket here. And when you plug in the top for a three, you get a four to the three-halves. Minus you plug in the bottom, and you get a one to the three-halves. Now, even back in 2000, you didn't have to simplify if it was a numeric answer. That being a numeric answer, you could stop if you put units at the end. Wherever you stop, you better put units. What are the units of this? Water units. Gallons. Good, gallons. Now, if you wanted to simplify, just do it carefully. You don't get bonus points. Four to the three halves is, remember, the square root of four, which is two. And then two cubed is eight. Eight minus one is seven. Seven times two-thirds was 14 thirds. But you don't get bonus points for that. In fact, if you call that 15 thirds, you just lost the check that you previously had. So wherever you stop, just put your units. If I wrote 14 thirds, I need to put gallons again. Part B, how many gallons are in the tank at three? Oh, I was waiting for this one. How many gallons are there in the tank at three? So the amount of water in the tank at any given time is a function of what I started with, right? We started with 30. Plus what I've gained. Water is going into the tank at a constant rate of eight gallons per minute. So over a three-minute period, how much did I add? 24, right? 8 times 3. Now, in the interest of indicating our method, maybe I'll call it 8 times 3 instead of 24. But it's a constant rate, so we don't need calculus. Minus the amount of water that leaked out from 0 to 3. We just found that on part A. So you don't have to put the integral anymore. You can import the answer from A. Now, here's the bad thing. If you didn't simplify it up there, you would just have to rewrite this whole thing as it is. Pass the minus sign, and that's fine. It's still an exact answer. In this case, I have it as 14 thirds, so I'll just write 14 thirds, a little bit faster, and then gallons. And that, could that could be your answer. Absolutely. No, right. You would just, of course, you can't copy and paste, but here's what you would, if you didn't want to still simplify, you could just do this, right? And that would, that would get you full credit. Not a very satisfying number, but it is totally correct. Yeah, looks good to me, too. All right, let's see how many points we've gotten so far. Um, the first part, you got three checks. One for your definite integral, one for the limits, one for the integrand, and then one for the answer. Or, this is what I was telling you, Avery, you could do the antiderivative with a plus C and then using the initial condition and then getting the answer. I wouldn't recommend that method, though. Okay, I like method one. Mm-hmm. 
And one for the limits, like if you integrate it from zero to three, and one for your integrand. Okay. So, so this got one, and this got one. Yeah. And by the way, Avery, I kind of went too fast there. If you were to put plus C, your initial condition is not zero thirty; it's actually zero zero because that T equals zero. How much water has leaked out? None, right? Thirty was how much water was actually in there. So, uh, yeah, I know. So another reason not to do it that way. Okay. Um, and then part two, which we've already done, you got one check for that, just one, which is not bad because it was really kind of easy. They set you up for success on part A. But again, notice how they did it. You have to kind of indicate your method. So eight times three on a free response is better than 24. Okay. Oh, yeah, good question. If you had 30 plus eight times three minus your answer from A, Full credit. Yeah, full credit. Yeah, full credit. Um, part C. Almost like the B question. Quash question. Write an expression for A of T, which gives the total number of gallons at time T. It's exactly like the B question. They ask you to do that up here at a specific time, 3, and now they're asking you to do it right below there at a generic time T. So you're doing a concrete example and then an a, a abstract example. Now, we called the uh, thing, I called it water, right? They said to call it A of T, I guess A for agua or amount, whatever, okay? Bless you. So the amount of agua at T is going to be what we started with, 30, right? Plus 8 times not 3, but T for any value of T. And then minus... Well, now we have to write the integral from 0 to T of the leak rate, which is the square root of T plus 1 dT, question mark? Well, that's the function. But remember, here's where it gets problematic. You want your independent variable, this T here, to be that T and the upper bound. But now there's some confusion here, right? So this is where you have to change it to anything else, and X is safe. Okay? Right, because now it's not just at 3. It's at any value of t. This is how we did this on part A. We just happened to plug in a 3. All right, so remember that these could be anything as long as they match. It could be PDP, MDM, ZDZ. But in this case, it can't be t because then there would be confusion as to where you're going to plug in the t. Is there anything that could be like a, a signal for us to remember that? Well, if they're asking you to write a function of a single variable, Always change it. Just always change it. Yeah, it's a good habit to change it. Yeah, I mean, really, if you're, if you're putting a variable here, it should not be down there. I don't know if that's your signal. If you ever write a question with a variable in your integrand, make sure that that variable is also not – I'm sorry. If you're writing a variable in the interval of integration, make sure that variable is never here. That could always be the key. They should never be the same variable. All right, so for that, I think you got two more checks then you would not get the second check, okay? You got one check here for having a 30 plus 8t, and then one check for minus the integral from 0 to t of any other variable plus 1 d variable, okay? So you would just lose the 1. All right, and finally, at what time during the two-hour period is the amount of water in the tank a maximum? So very similar to the B question, right? We want to know when the Bs were at a maximum in. So where do absolute maximums occur? Endpoints or critical values. Okay. They're setting you up again for success. There's the equation that you're trying to maximize. So we are doing the EVT. It's one way to do it. You could say, okay, I need the amount at zero. I need the amount at 120. And I also need the amount at any critical value. How do we find critical values? Take the derivative, set it equal to zero. So remember, we have the team endpoint is ready to play the buzzer game. We just got to go out and find team critical value. So off to the side here, A prime of T is, let's see, the derivative of 30 is 0. The derivative of 8T is 8. And then it's just this. Good. This is the second fundamental theorem. We're taking the derivative of the integral, and it's the special case. From plain old number to plain old variable, here's where it's just the square root of T plus 1. Now, on the B problem, 
many students in this class got the derivative of the B equation, but then didn't do anything with it. This does not earn you a check. Guess what earns you the first check on this part? Setting it equal to zero. Yeah. That earns the check. And now if you solve that, separate, square, you get t equals 63. Hello? I certainly will. Mm -hmm. Jessica, you're, uh, you're checking out the attendance office. Because it's the derivative of the integral. So remember, if we're taking the derivative of this term, the general procedure is you plug that in, and then times the derivative of what you plugged in, which is 1, minus you plug in the bottom, times the derivative of what you plugged in. Right. So that just turns out to be t plus 1. Now, setting it equal to 0 gets you a check. Finding 63 gets you a second check. This is only worth three checks. We have a lot of work left to do, and it's only worth one check. Okay? So there is a lot of work left to do. So now what you would do is you would evaluate each of these. A of 0 is easy. That's 30. There were 30 gallons to begin with. But I need to figure out what A of 120 are and A of 63 are in much the same manner I figured out what A of 3 was up here. So it's going to be 30 plus 8 times 120, 8 times 63, minus, and then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can kind of redo this. It's going to be 2 thirds of 121 minus 1, and then 64 minus 1. So it's a lot of work. But that would then be the justification. I'm not going to find the numbers. And then you would be staring at your maximum. So then you answer the question. And it does end up being the critical value. So... The, the water is a maximum at T equals 63 minutes. And all of that work is one check. Now, let's look at the scoring guidelines because, as I mentioned when we did optimization, there's another way to justify. You have to do a modified first derivative test. But let's look over here first. Setting A prime equal to zero. Check. Okay? Solving for T and getting 63. Check. So if you didn't get the last part, you're like, oh, that's a lot of work. I'm just going to stop. You're getting 8 out of 9. That's still fantastic. You could do a modified first derivative test. Since A prime is positive, every word to the left of 63, down to 0, which is our relevant domain, and negative everywhere to the right of 63, up to 120, our upper bound, then 63 is not only the location of the local max, but also the absolute max. Okay, so you could also do that, and you can almost just say it on faith. Everywhere to the left, though, and everywhere to the right. So it's more than just a local max. It's an absolute max. All right, we didn't get to this next one here, but it's just implicit differentiation. We kind of already have done that. So um, if you want to look at the scoring guidelines, they're online, 2000. So tomorrow, we will pick up with day two, not AB2, but DAYO2. At the top, we'll grade the multiple choice, answer any questions you have. We won't work, work through all of them, and then we'll spend some quality time on the free response. Okay? That's it. So you'll have a homework assignment every night now. Yes. If you do the free response, then when we go over it, you're going to get more out of it. You reap what you sow in that case. I'm not going to grade it. And if you don't have time, and as long as you're paying attention, you can still get something out of it. But having worked it and then see me go through it, you're getting it twice. It's always good to have your pump primed when you come in. Yes. Right. That's how we're going to do it. So you're always investing a little before we come in. Yes. 